Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Blue is the New White podcast. I apologize, I am a little under the weather, so you're going to have to deal with my nasally voice in this episode, but good news is I got a haircut, so if you are watching this episode, you're welcome. If you're listening, I am sorry. Anyways, today we welcome back to the show Mr. Ken Midget. The last time we talked to Ken, he was working as a plumbing instructor at the Lehigh Institute. It's through Ken that we actually first met Paige Knowles. If you haven't heard any of the episodes with Paige, do yourself a favor and go back in the episode list and find them. If there's such a thing as the next big thing in the skilled trades, she's it. Well, back to Ken. A lot has happened since the last time we talked to him, and we're going to get all caught up. He ended up changing careers to become a home domain expert for nationwide insurance, and then that led him to a mutual connection of mine, Interplay Learning. If you haven't heard the episode with Doug Donovan from Interplay, be sure to go back and check that one out too uh, to find out what Interplay is all about. Listen, the bulk of this episode, though, is filled with actual, tangible information and advice on how to procure students from local schools to begin home growing your own technicians. So grab a notepad for this one, folks. Ken drops some unbelievable information that is sure to level up your business some kids' careers, and the entire skilled trades industry as we know it. As always, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and on our website at bluesthenewwhite.com to release, uh, receive all the latest updates. As always, this show is not monetized and we don't run ads. We rely strictly on the word of mouth from our listeners to further the mission. So if you enjoy this episode, please take a second to rate it, review it, and share it. Please don't review my nasally voice. The future generations of tradespeople depend on it. They depend on you, as in all of civilization as well. So thank you again, and enjoy this episode of the Blue is the New White podcast with Mr. Ken Midget. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Blue is the New White podcast. We have a returning guest today. Super excited to have him back on the show because our first conversation was so great. And it was actually shared with another guest, Paige Knowles, who has been on the show a couple of times now already. If you haven't caught her episodes, definitely go back. Definitely give those a listen. Ken actually came on with her the first time that he was on the show as well um, as her instructor. So we've got Ken back to find out what's been going on since the last time we talked. But before we do that, Ken, first off, welcome back to the show, my man. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. I'm always excited to be on it. And um, we'll talk about Paige some more, too. There's some more things going on with her. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm sure we'll get into that. I just saw a post from her yesterday. But uh, uh, so, you know, for those who didn't see the first episode and who don't know who you are, can you just kind of give us a quick overview? If you want to know really who Ken is, you got to go back and listen to that first one. But he's going to give you his two-minute elevator speech right now as to kind of who he is and how he got to where he is today. Um. Well, a long, long time. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, doing it a long time, plumbing, heating, and uh, HVAC. Um, started out, got journeyman's, got my apprenticeship, got my master's, went into my own gig. Um, did that for over a 27-year period. Did a new construction company, did a service and repair company. Um, both were really successful, but uh, an opportunity came to... Uh, teach in career and technical education uh, here in Lehigh Valley. So um, I was prompted by the local association, plumbing association, and um, I applied thinking I will never get this because I do not have a day of college in my life. And long and behold, I was the top person out of like 45 applicants. So uh, it was a cool thing. Um, jumped in, didn't really know a lot about teaching. Um, Thought this is going to be great. I could just tell everybody, tell these kids stories about my career and about owning a business, and they'll they'll go to sleep and I can go do some work. <laughs> but uh, it didn't work out that way. Uh, stories work once in a while, but probably about you know point one 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 percent. You know, it was really uh, a very minor part of the training, right? That we offer. So um, by the time I got to year two, I got my feet on the ground, got some stabilization in the classroom and really started to take off. And then um, 12 plus years later, um, had a really strong program that 
uh, was 100% placement for every single graduate that was eligible, um, had a, literally a machine running for the cooperative education, the job shadows, a lot of connections in industry, um, had one of the largest uh, memberships for the Occupational Advisory Council for the program, so a tremendous amount of industry support. And I won two national teaching awards in my time there uh, as a career and technical ed teacher, which kind of catapulted me in the spotlight with uh, LinkedIn. Very cool, which kind of is where we leave off, right? That's the last time that I spoke with you, you were still teaching, but mm -hmm. shortly thereafter, uh, you had made a career change, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, mm -hmm. so why don't you you, you kind of catch us up? Let's uh, let's get up to speed with uh, with Ken Midget here. Nice. So I, um, as I said, when when the awards hit, um, I, things got a little crazy, and I started to get a lot of people contacting me, mostly from training and digital environments, digital, digital organizations. Um, Nationwide was one of the players that contacted me. Ended up taking a job with them. Um, and I worked in their digital organization and enterprise space. So I worked directly with um, startups that are designed to help transition the whole insurance space from the traditional um, agent that you many of us grew up with talking to an agent, right? This is now more on a digital basis and you know, just trying to adapt to the younger environment that's coming into purchasing insurance. So uh, I basically was a home domain expert for them. That's kind of what my title was. I managed, um, at, at one time, there was uh, 20 of these virtual experts for a product. And I, I hired and trained all of the, I hired some of them and trained all of them how to use a product that was designed to virtually diagnose something uh, with a residential application for electric plumbing and HVAC. Um, it was a test environment, you know, it was a startup within the nationwide company, um, didn't, didn't get a whole lot of traction, but still is running as of today, but just not the capacity I thought it was never got to scale. Um, the beginning of this year, 2022, um, I started to have a couple conversations with interplay learning, um, and those conversations developed in me becoming a full-time employee there. I am now their uh, plumbing market director. So I lead the entire plumbing catalog, make the decisions about um, what's going to be in the content, what kind of content there's going to be, what kind of courses there's going to be, as well as looking into the other adjacent markets. Um, where does you know HV, HVAC and plumbing kind of slide together here and there? Uh, there's some applications for electric. There's some applications for solar. Um, obviously hydronics on the HVAC side. And then there's also uh, facilities maintenance and um, hospitalization and oh, I'm sorry, hospitality. So there's a lot of places that the content can touch. And that's kind of my job is to assess that and to build a real program. So that's kind of what I'm gonna be working on. But I literally just started, this is week three for me there. So I have like three toes on the ground. That's a <laughs> It's, it's a typical um, business that's very fast paced. The entire business is digital and I work from home. So that's kind of where I'm at with that. And I love it. I absolutely love it. Very cool. And for those listening, if Interplay sounds a little bit familiar to you, uh, the uh, CEO, um, Doug, Doug Donovan? Yeah. Doug Donovan. Yeah, that's yeah. Him. yeah I'm, I was almost thinking about his brother. I think his, his brother's Brian. But uh, yes. yeah, so Doug has been on the show and he's he's talked all about you know uh, the interplay platform, what they do, what they focus on, and where they're going in the future. So if you haven't listened to that episode yet, definitely go back if you want a little bit of context as to where Ken is working now. And like he said, you know he's only three weeks in, so uh, he can only speak on, on on a little bit of it. I am interested though, Ken, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us what drew you into uh, uh, getting into like a digital space like that, a digital learning platform. You know, what, what was appealing to you just about, you know, that aspect of what you do? That's such a super cool question. Uh, one, I've always been a technical geek. Even when I was in the classroom, um, 
a lot of my program was technology and I insisted that my students learn technology and not learn to use it. You're learning to use the phone as a tool and not a toy. So there was a lot of that going on. Um, learning how to understand spreadsheets, how to write documents, how to, you know, place a picture in a document, simple things that every, a lot of the people take for granted. Um, students just did not know how to do that and did not know how to, you know, convert that computer into a tool for them, a learning environment and a memory tool and a reminder tool. Um, so we, we did spend a lot of time on that in the classroom. That just kind of transferred. I was always the guy that's got to, you know, have the latest iPhone, iWatch, I have, you know, all these gadgets. I, just, I can't stop myself, iPad. Um, so I've always been involved with computers. And when I had the business, the, compu the business was computer heavy, right? So that kind of is my world. The big reason I went to Interplay is that it gave me the perfect, it's the perfect score for me because uh, it's the digital environment and I'm making the impact on the skill trades. And that is where my passion comes from. By far, I you know, I, that's what I want to see happen. I want to see this software or any software really. I mean, I'm biased because I work for this company, but anything that any vehicle or tool that we can use to engage the young learner to want to come into the industry is, it's right. I'm right there with it. Yeah, that makes sense, especially after you 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 say it like that. You know, knowing that you're a tech geek, this is like the best of both worlds, right? This is mm -hmm. that's that's mm -hmm. that side of you. You know, combining with uh, uh, with your your technical expertise, you know, man, that that sounds like a uh, a really good spot. So, congratulations to you, and definitely can thank you. Congratulations thank you. to Interplay as well because they got a good one. So, I uh, I'm definitely excited to have you back on the show once you do have your feet underneath you to talk a little bit about what Interplay is doing and the exciting stuff that's going on there. Anything that you're Absolutely. at liberty to talk about. But until then, let's put a pin in that and kind of get into some other stuff that you've been up to. Uh, you and I had spoke, you just recently, uh, I think you said back in March, you wrote an article uh, right on uh, on CTE, uh, uh, career technical education, you know, and uh, and how that can be used as a tool. So you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Yeah, we can talk. Yeah, I think there's there's some good nuggets in here for listeners to get to uh, some some places it'll it'll resonate and they can you know go back to their office and implement it or or use some, have somebody in their office implement it. But uh, yeah, I just wrote an article. Thought, man, this could maybe help some people get people into their company, find find uh, people that have a little bit of knowledge that are going to walk in the door and hopefully come from a strong program. I want to give a little shout out to PHC, PHCP pros are the ones who actually published the article. Um, so uh, yeah, it just starts out with talking about looking for homegrown technicians. That's kind of where I, my, my head was at with it when I started to write. And um, you know, you, there, there, is a, there is a model, which I'm going to share with you of how you can get students out of a career in technical education school. And for the record, you know, CTE, Career Technical Ed, Votech, they're all the same thing. For all you guys out and girls out there that call it Votech or Vocational Ed, CTE is the same thing, just to make a disclaimer. Yeah. Uh, I also want to make a tiny disclaimer and say that, you know, you, this may not work in your state or in your market area, and you need to make sure you do everything you're supposed to do to check child labor laws. You're going to be hiring people that are under 18 and probably 15 years old and up. So you have to check all those things. And 99% of the time, you're going to be doing it through the school, and they are going to act as the policeman or policewoman to make sure that you are doing what you're supposed to do. There is, there are things and th things involved with this. You, you're going to need to have a background check if you're going to hire one of these students. Most states are going to require that. So. Um, that all said, what, what the meat and potatoes here for, for you, for your takeaway to listen to this, is that it's an opportunity for you to get HVAC, electrical, plumbing, carpentry, a bunch of skills. Basically, any domain that's taught in that school is an opportunity for you to get for your program. And I need you to think, put your big, big hat on and think big. Like, you know, don't you have people in your warehouse? Don't you have people that are in the office? There are, there's some schools have business courses, right? 
You may not you may not get them and acquire them forever because they may move on to college, but they may fill a gap for you. Um, you know, during the, during the work year, that they can come in and work three or four hours on a week on a weekday or on a Saturday to help do invoicing or whatever. So don't overlook those things when you look at this whole picture. You know, I want to interrupt uh, you there real quick if I could uh, to provide sure. a, a real life example uh, of that. A couple of them actually, because there's a lot to be said. You know about exactly what you're talking about. Uh, on multiple occasions, I've brought in uh, students in high school into my organization, you know, and uh, uh, they started off really small, right? Part time, you know, one kid actually just started off taking taking out the trash. I, I think I might have told you about him before too. worked his way up uh, after four or five years to be a lead installer. You know, his wages just I mean, I think he three or four X what he was making It was just incredible. Um, you know, in such a short amount of time, but then also just recently, you know, had another parts runner parts runners kind of like our, our intro, you know, for, for the kids. Yeah. 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 And so he took a different path. He literally just last week, he was promoted to, um, our CSR position. So he wanted to be, you know, customer facing and, uh, and dealing with the customers, which is just as important in the skilled trades, you know, to have that back end support. You know, so there's a lot of opportunity here that, you know, people shouldn't overlook. And you and I have seen examples of this firsthand. So uh, really happy that you brought that up. The second question I have before we move forward, uh, because I, I want to make sure that uh, that this gets explained too. We're talking about home growing uh, technicians. And I want my audience to understand why that's important right now. It may be obvious to you and me, but if we have any newer listeners to the show, you know, that are just kind of getting interested in this industry or what's going on with it, why is it so important to home grow technicians? Well, one thing I think about that is um, you're not going to, you're not going to bring on any bad habits. So when you hire somebody with experience, you have no idea how they were trained. Um, so this is your opportunity to say, to teach them your operation, right? This is your operational procedures. My company uses press for putting in water heaters. My company doesn't, my, my company solders, so on and so forth. All these details that can happen on the fly. And then that person, this person you bring into your company, you're growing them to work the way you want them to work. Right, they're going to understand your operational procedure. They're going to understand how to take time cards down. Where's this? Where's that? And I'm going to come back to this a little bit. I revisit this little tiny part of this discussion, like what the value is to bringing in a high schooler, and when they graduate, all that stuff's out of the way. Right, all that stuff is done. Who do I go to for this? What's the name of the person at the supply house? What shelf is this on? Where's the keys to the truck? All that information is done because you've migrated it over this time that you've had them working for you during the school year, right? On, on internships and, and job shadows, which we're gonna dive, dive a little deeper into. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways that you um, get yourself involved with this is most schools and most programs have an occupational advisory council, it's called an OAC. Um, Again, thinking big-minded, you don't have to join one. You don't have to join the one for just your discipline. If you're a plumber and you have people working in your office, join the business one or the one that teaches Microsoft products, right? The data entry person. So think bigger than, than just the, uh, and, and the CR, CSR thing that you had mentioned earlier. Think bigger than just the plumbing department. It's a real easy lift. It's two meetings a year. They're usually in the evening. Most schools feed you during those meetings. And your job is to advise the instructor on new things. You're supposed to give the industry input towards that program. So if they're still playing around with mercury thermostats, that would be a time that you would say, hey, you know, these things aren't even out there anymore. You know, you need to get, you got to, here's what you should be teaching. And here's what you should be showing these students, just as an example, right? So um, your job is to help steer that teacher so that they are teaching because the people that are in that room in Pennsylvania, they're, they're considered the stakeholders. They're the ultimate person that's going to receive the benef benefactors of the, of the student walking out the door with a little bit of education 
in the industry, right? So they're, that's why they're valued so much. So you do that, you get joined in, and we're gonna give a little bit more predominant way how, how you work on that. I wanna make sure I get through these points. You, you get into the OAC membership. Next thing you know, you're starting to make uh, connections with the teacher. And um, hopefully this teacher is, this teacher's goal or instructor's goal is to get students working in cooperative education. What's that mean? Instead of coming to the classroom, they go to an employer and they work. So if it's a LCTI had uh, two sessions, they had a morning session and an afternoon session. Most of the seniors were in the afternoon. So this student would show up at your at your shop or office at you know, 11, 30, 12 o'clock and you're gonna use them for the rest of the day and get them on a job site. One of the things, I'll just interject this here, that COVID was a positive way in this environment is that many of the students were able to do asynchronous cyber school learning. And now these students were able to work full days. So they could work Monday through Thursday, as an example, or Monday through Wednesday. And then on those other two days, they could do their academic work and satisfy the requirements of the school, get their credits. But their meantime, they're building their career. Um, I actually had an LCTI in my last time, weeks there, um, students who were going to graduate and have their first year of apprenticeship, plumbing apprenticeship under their belt, they were going to have their 2000 hours done. Wow. So they were graduating and becoming a second level apprentice hourly on, on, the, on the investment hours as an apprentice. So it was a pretty cool thing to see that happen. So how do you get to this co-op? How do you get in this game with this co-op thing? Well, uh, one way is to involve yourself with what our program called Job Shadows. It's, it's kind of like a one day interview. The student shows up at your shop, they ride with the tech all day, or you put them on a new construction site. No, you can't have them climb the 13 foot ladders. You can't have them jumping in and out of trenches, but you certainly can say, hey, uh, stand there and hand me this fitting when I talk to you. You see that fitting there, that elbow? When I say elbow, you hand me that fitting. They're allowed to do things like that. So they, you know, they're engaging and they're they're evaluating you what it's like for you to work for. So um, keep in mind that when you're going to send them out with a tech, don't send them out with one that's that's probably not a tech that wants to engage with somebody and talk <laughs> to them. Yeah, right. Fair point. Um, send them out with somebody who who really wants your company to be successful and looks at this as a vehicle to help uh, be accomplished. You know, getting people in the door. Um, so they spend the day with you. Maybe you have to schedule another one. You want to make a second look at this person. And then if that works and that person has all the eligibility that the teacher says, and they have a car and they have a driver's license, you then start the process to have them on co-op, right? And it's literally that simple. So two days invested in, in, at your company um, and then paperwork clearances within, a, within two weeks, that person can be working for you. And, and adding value to your company. And, and now you've got somebody in the loop. Again, going back to that onboarding process and that home homegrown methodology. Now you're getting this person into the fold. They're learning, they're learning about the other people that work for you. And, and this doesn't, this has no prejudice. This can be a one person shop or a 50 person shop. There's no prejudice here, right? It's what you want and what you want to have. Yeah. Now, what about you want to what about if you don't mind me uh, interjecting just real quick? No, go ahead. Uh, what about from the student's perspective? Like, what are they being told that would make them want to uh, enter into this program from their point of view? You know, do the job shadowing and be partnered up with a, a company like mine, you know, or or somebody else in the trades. The common denominator is money. Nice. Teenagers need money. And here's the best gig in town, right? You don't have to work at McDonald's. You don't have to work at the convenience stores. You don't have to stock shelves. Are you going to do some jobs that aren't the best and maybe not the cleanest? Yeah, but guess what? When everybody else is in school, you're working. So you have your week nights off. You may or may not, depending on the arrangement, have your weekends off when everybody else is working at the stores and doing whatever else they do to earn money for their car. Um, this literally became a machine in my in my program at LCTI in that when the co-op students would come into school, 
They would have the new phones. They would have the nice clothing. They would have the cars. They would have all these things because they were working, yeah. right? Um, and then when my alumni would come in, they would have the big brand new trucks and the new phones and all these things. So um, yeah, that, that the younger ones that didn't see that, they, they aspired to that and said, man, I want this. This, is, this sounds like a great game. You know, I don't, have to, I don't have to work at a convenience store. I don't have to work in fast food. I don't have to work till 11 o'clock at night, at least not right now, I don't have to. And I can learn, I can, I can acquire my apprenticeship hours, I can start my networking process and learning people in the world and how this all works. So um, it's a great game for them. You just have to make sure they're exposed to it, the student. Makes sense, that makes a lot of sense. All right, go ahead, keep going. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, no, not at all. So the ultimate scenario is, is that you, when you try this, if you want to see how this is going to work is in the fourth marking period in the March or May, um, or March between March and May, you start getting involved with trying to acquire a junior, preferably an 11th grader that's going to work in the summer. And at the end of that summer, if everything worked out and you you like this student and they they're productive for you and they're and you you have a compatibility thing there you've built rapport with them you start to talk about the fall situation and being on co-op in the fall then they work the entire fall year as a senior when they graduate they're yours it's the best way that's the homegrown stepping stones right there yeah. you can also ask that instructor, hey, do you have any 12th graders that are ready for hire upon graduation? You can certainly go that route. You're probably going to, if the program's successful, you're probably going to get told no because they're all taken. Right, right. Right. And the ones that are graduating at 12th grade and they're not available, there's probably eligibility issues. They don't have a car. Um, there's dis There may or may not be discipline problems. Maybe Maybe by the time of the end of 12th grade came around, they realized plumbing's not their forte. They don't want to do it. So there's all kinds of dynamics of why the person's not eligible to do that. Um, no one ever got out the door in my program unless I felt I would hire them. It was that simple. Makes sense. That was just kind of my philosophy. Um, so here's some other things um, that you can do to help yourself become more involved and embedded in this, to be the person that's, you know, we're going to be the leader that's going to get the quote best people, right? That's what you want. Everybody wants the best. This is your opera. This is the, this is a way for you to do it. It's going to take you a little bit more time and work, but it will pay off. I've watched it happen with contractors that were involved with my program, how it paid off. So most CTE schools have a completion exam for their seniors or their program completers. That's the correct terminology. The teachers can, cannot proctor these exams. They have to be proctored by somebody who has a license or at least a journeyman as a, as a, as a very minimum. So they're always looking to have somebody come in and the, the, the exam is administered in the laboratory that they were, that were taught in. So uh, it's usually a two-part exam. One part will be a psychomotor skill where they may have to rough in a bathroom. The other part's a written exam. So the, the psychomotor skill where they have to do this roughing in the bathroom thing, they have to um, be proctored with that. And what better way for you to look at somebody and see what their skill sets are? They're already nervous, right? Because they're taking a test that they really need to pass. You're a stranger to them. Right. So what better way for you to see the behaviors that you want to see in a, in a, and have in somebody that works in your company? Great opportunity to see that. Right. So being a proctor for a completion exam, Skills USA at the district, state and national level are always looking for proctors and um, judges. Get yourself involved with Skills USA. It's a great thing. And again, that also gives you that lateral movement to look at other skill sets. You know, maybe you're maybe you're gonna do, maybe you do remodeling and you could really use a helper that can do luxury, luxury vinyl plank or carpentry or hang drywall. This is the place that you could find that person, right? Um, and just from you being there, you're gonna see that. Schools typically have uh, grant councils and curriculum review boards. Offer to be on one. It's a, it's a really low lift. It's maybe once a year, twice a year. It typically, it's, it's a breakfast type thing. 
Um, you'll go in and they're going to ask you questions about apprenticeship and grants and how could you apply this grant to this piece of equipment and what's in your discipline? What kind of grants can we help your plumbing instructor get for the program? You know, this is the time to speak up. Here's where we can get money, right? How does this money, how does this grant apply to what you think you want to get, right? So there's all these opportunities there for you to be the go-to person, right? The company, right? Teachers are certainly going to let you come into, the, into their classroom. Once you have a relationship with any teacher, they're going to have it. Um, hey, bring four or five of your techs in and do like a speed dating thing. Let, let these students ask your technicians questions about what it's like to work in your company, right? I know some of this stuff sounds like, Ken, you're really stretching it. And I am, but I know that it works because I've done these things, right? This is like pushing the envelope here to get this to happen, but it's a great way to do it. Go start out with just going into the classroom, talk about expectations, talk about work ethic, talk about work rate. What's it like to be on a job site? Um, things that are tolerated, things that aren't tolerated. These are This is valuable information for these young learners to understand and paint the picture of what it's like to work in your company. Um, so, so have that relationship as well, where the teacher will call you and say, hey, I got a free afternoon, lots of seniors in there. I'd love to have you come in and talk to them. Maybe bring in some tools, maybe bring in some, some of your high flyers, let them talk to them. Um, you know, spread that, those one-on-one -on -one conversations with your higher, your higher level people, they are powerful. I mean, with these kids, they'll just cling to that, right? Um, how to have a shop visit, have them come in your shop, right? Plan, plan a trip. If your shop's too small, get, some, get, get a, 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 somebody else that you, that's in your market area, that's maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes away. Have them go to your shop in the morning and somebody else's in the afternoon. Feed them pizza, play some games, you know, get them involved. Let them, let them see how your office works. Let them, let them act like they're making a call. See how CSR answers the phone. These are things that they need to be exposed to, right? Another thing you could do is act as a point, a liaison between trade associations and the supply house. So help facilitate getting scratch and dent water heaters to that, to that shop so those kids can work on that stuff. You know, career and technical education is extremely expensive. The budgets, especially now with inflation and just, you know, things just going up and up and up and up. You know, if you can help them get a scratch and dent, something that that's still usable for them to learn from and work on, do it. You know, a faucet with a chip in it, you know, a, 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 a toilet bowl that has a fish eye or something. That They can work with that, right? So look for those things and be that liaison that, you know, maybe you have a couple of reps factory reps in your back pocket or manufacturers that you can talk to and say, hey, use, use me. I can help put this stuff in good use you know, instead of just putting it in a dumpster. Um, I feel like I'm rambling now. You no, should probably smack, just, so, smack me uh, around a little bit. You know what? You know what, Ken? This is I, I'm enjoying this so much because it's actual tangible information that people can take home and implement right. and utilize right away. And listen, yeah. I love every guest that I've had on this show. There's been 126 of them now, you know, and and they all have some very, very great ideas, you know, but I probably have a handful, you know, maybe a little bit more that can give me some actual, and my listeners, some actual things to, to do, like step by step by step. So I'm just, you know, I'm sitting here just letting you ramble because it's fascinating. You know, and these are these are things that that people can take home, you know, in in, in my position and uh, in similar positions to really, you know, provide opportunities not only for their company, not only for the students, but for the industry as a whole. You know, so this is multi-level. I am wondering, Ken, because you said that uh, before you got into the education part of everything, you did own a couple of businesses yourself. And I'm wondering how much of this you knew when you owned your own business. I mean, I have to imagine that most of it was learned uh, from your education side. So what mm -hmm. steps did you take when you were a business owner? And, you know, what would it have been like if you would, would have known then what you know now? Oh, if I would have known about this um, when I had the service company, I would have been all over this. Um, and I kind of was a little bit, um, 
the program was really weak in my market area um, where my company was. So even, even if I knew this, I don't know how well it would have worked. The, the teacher and the, and the strength of the program and the strength of the school makes everything work here. I was extremely aggressive to have a, a high level program that was going to produce high level learners. When these, when, it, when it's, one of my students would come on a job shadow with you, they knew put that freaking phone in your pocket. Do <laughs> not take it out. Don't twiddle your phone at all, you know, and interact with the person in that truth. You're in a situation where you're driving from job to job to job, ask questions, act like you want to learn. If you can't figure out a question, there's always this very, I said, here's your default question. Tell me how you got into this gig. I need to know about it. How'd you get started? That's an, an open-ended question that's going to last a little bit of time, right? Again, make sure you're sending the right technicians with these people. You don't want some, oh my God, you don't want to do this for a living. You, know, you don't want to have that going on. In, in your, in, and you, we all have them, so, especially in today's world. Um, so to answer your question, I didn't take... I didn't utilize this and, and probably a little bit more ignorance and a little bit of knowing that the program just didn't have the strength, but I was involved in that school um, for, as an adult educator. I taught adult school at night for that school. So um, I did get my toe in the water, if you will, from an education perspective. Very cool. Um, another thing that you can do is reach out to the wholesalers in your area and this, this you can, you know, you can kind of act in the middle, maybe, or even just percolate the idea to the teacher. Reach out to the wholesalers. Let them go to the wholesalers. Bring in seven or eight factory reps. They spend the whole day at the wholesaler. They watch the wholesale distribution operation. So this isn't limited to contractors, by the way. This is wholesalers too. Those guys need employees, right? Um, so let them come into the company. Let them see how things get stocked. If it's a automated business and you got robots running around taking stuff show them all that like show them that by the way most cte schools have a shipping and receiving department that is an actually educational format right. right so there's another thing that wholesalers should be looking at for a source of truck drivers a lot of them have heavy equipment operators right another source for um you know getting people into your company this isn't a quick fix this is a little bit of a longer term way but I guarantee you, if your onboarding costs are twenty thousand dollars, this is going to cost you five thousand dollars. Right. Right. This is a five grand investment for you compared to twenty grand. Right. Um, so that's another opportunity to get them out of the classroom, get them into the industry, let them see a let them see a, a, a wholesale supply, let manufacturers reps come there, talk about water heaters, talk about faucets, talk about flushometers, show them stuff. Right. Do it showtime, right? You want to sell those kids to come into this industry? This is a way to do it. Make it make it app appealing to them. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So, how do you get started? Right? You don't know anything about this. Find out if there's a CTE school in your area. Next step is find out if they have disciplines that are maybe for your market area, right? For your discipline, do they have plumbing, or is it only HVAC, or do they have a business course? Do they have a computer technology course that you can use those students for data entry? That's where you start. Then once you have that, most of their contact information will be on the school website, right? Most of the time. Uh, and email is probably the best communication tool for them because they're heads down once those bells ring and those kids walk into classes. There's no time to talk, right? You, you've got to do it by email or set up a time to talk with them. Um, schedule face-to-face -face visit, visit, do a sit down, sit down with the teacher. Hey, you know, um, I'm so-and-so, this is the size of my company, you know, or schedule an offsite visit if you want. You have a cup of coffee, it'd be that easy. Um, one thing about all of this that has to be kept in reality here, think about what you were like when you were in high school, <laughs> right? Just think about that for 15 seconds, you know, what that was like. You forgot your locker combination. You got up late for school. You locked the keys in the car. You, you know, you, you, these are all things that these students are gonna make the mistake, right? They're gonna make this mistake. They're, they're gonna forget to come to work. They're gonna show up late. They may have an accident on the way to work, right? They, it, it, I've seen all kinds of crazy things happen. 
Um, inclement weather causes problems. You know, sometimes a student gets confused. You know, their school is closed for the day because of snow, but your company's open and working. This is a communication thing. You got to be texting and back and forth and keeping things organized. You got to take the higher road and realize you're dealing with a teenager, right? And I want to put all, squash all this stuff and put it aside about these kids don't want to work. I'm, you know, I am so sick of hearing this. I'm going to, they don't want to work. They don't want to do nothing. All they want to do is play <laughs> on their phone. Make the rules. Yeah. If they don't abide by the rules, then you don't bring them on in the co-op spot. It's that simple. You don't hire them if you don't think they're they're manageable because yeah. you think they're that crazy that all they're going to do is twiddle their phone all day. You've yeah. got to make those. You've got to generate the environment that you want them to work in. That's absolutely right. And and I'll I'll add too that. You know, the more you generalize, the more issues you're going to create for yourself because you're just going to, you're creating your own barrier. You know what I mean? Because I've seen it yeah. too. Like, like the same things can be said for any generation. There are people who don't want to work. There are, you know, and, and, you know, the, the latest generations and the oldest generations all included, you know, and, and so it, it does make me laugh a little bit, especially after, I wrote the book and I've been doing this podcast and I've been talking more and more with, uh, with people like you and, you know, even with the younger generation and, and stuff like that. And the, the, the parallels are amazing, you know, mm -hmm. but the, uh, uh, the perceptions are just, they're ever existent. I mean, <laughs> yes, you know, they're overarching. Yes, yes. It's, it's really, it's wild, but to your point, set expectations, drive accountability. It's very, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's actually very, at, at the heart of it, it's very simple that it should cascade not only to your younger generation, but everybody inside your organization. Yeah. There's a, a contractor uh, that took a very supportive of the program and um, highly successful contractor and probably took a lot of my students to the point that when I go to his company picnic, there's at least eight or nine of my alumni walking around in this thing, you know, <laughs> and it's really cool to see all of them and see their growth and see their career growth. It's such a wonderful thing to see it happen. But he actually had a whiteboard and it's Larry Shoemaker Deluxe Plumbing. He's in Bethlehem, PA. He had a huge whiteboard, a nine foot long whiteboard painted on the wall. And he had all the, you know, all the tasks on there that these co-op students could do. And he had a theme, right? So I watched somebody do it. Somebody watched me do it. I did it by myself. And I thought that was the coolest thing in the world that these kids, and this became a competition to see who could get the most checks. Somebody watched me do it. Somebody watched me do it by myself. Like this was a cool thing for these kids to aspire to. So really he had, learn. so he had this, this board on, and so what it had the three columns, did it uh, watch it had somebody? three columns, three rows, three and it, rows. it had like install nail plates for the new construction oh, okay. site. Okay, so right? a bunch of basic tasks and stuff. Right, like that. install nail plates, install install pipe insulation. So I watched somebody put nail plates up. Somebody watched me put them up. I put them up on my own. So and cool. each ten, they would just keep going vertically, horizontally with the task, and vertically where the where the responsibility right of where within each task. So, you know, and it went all the way across, you know, from putting in a sump pump, putting in a garbage disposal, doing a small drain cleaning job, using a plunger. I mean, it just went on and on and on. And these kids, they could not wait to populate these checks <laughs> on this whiteboard. It was like a big touting thing for them to say, I got 20 checks this week. How many did you get? You know, it was a competition. That's so um, you got you got to be that business owner that wants to drive this, right? But I guarantee his onboarding costs are nowhere near that somebody's you know, I don't see him hanging a sign out there and saying, uh, you know, it's, we'll give you a signing bonus for $3,000 because he's breeding these kids right up right. through the program. Well, and and you're not even talking yet about turnover because that's a whole right. other conversation when you home grow technicians, right? Yes. And you help yes. somebody build their own resume. They don't that's want to right. leave. They want to keep that's building. Right. Bingo. All right. That's one of my last things that I say is in, in the article. It says, you know, if you invest... There's, there, you're in like the 90 percentile. If you invest in these kids, they're not going to leave. Oh. And if they are, maybe you need, maybe it's, maybe it is you, maybe it's not you. But if at a minimum, you need to do a little soul searching and a little analyzation to make sure it's not you. Yeah. That it was something, you know, that just happened. Um, I actually had one contractor who um, took a female 
and she did not have a driver's license. They, she, and she was an inner city student. So she's inner city, center city, Allentown. They picked her up every day and dropped her off and they paid for her driver's license training and her test. Wow. So she could drive. I mean, that's how impressed they were. And they wanted to get a female technician. She has her master's by the way now, but this is how she started out as a junior, right? Um, the, they, 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 they invested in her, into her. So, okay. So how you know, what are the cost to, to do all this, picking the student up, uh, at the end of the day or dropping them off and maybe doing the driver's license, you know, what did it cost them three, four grand to do all that? They got a, they got a gem out of the deal. Yeah. And she's still yeah. working there and she has her master's. And you know what? I mean, anybody in, in, in my position knows, especially, you know, the, the old school way of doing things, even, you know, going through recruiters and stuff like that, how much that costs. I mean, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars for a single employee. And, you know, sure, sometimes that employee is worth it. But more often than not, you still have the same issues. You still have turnover. You know, you still have. And, and guess what? That money is out either way. So when you're talking about sheer ROI, as long as this is done yeah. correctly, you're right. I mean, the opportunity is there. You know, it, it really is. And I challenge everybody out there to, to your point earlier, I challenge everybody out there too to question why anybody would leave your company. You know, sometimes it's That's you, right. sometimes it's them. But for instance, if anybody leaves here, we have the exit interview and we pass it around the leadership team and we say, what could we have done better? You know, and, and listen, I challenge everybody. Sometimes it is just the person, right? I mean, I had somebody leave because he wanted to start a, a, a home gym or not a home gym, but a, a gym. Like, I can't compete with that. I get that. That's right. But That's right. there's something in there. There's something I, 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 every single time that we can learn. So what can mm -hmm. we learn? And I challenge everybody out there to do the same thing. Yeah. You, you always need to, anytime someone's going to leave, you need to make sure it's not about that person. It's about your company knowing the reason and the rationale for the person to leave. And as to your point, what could you have done to prevent it? Right. You know, what can you put in place that that doesn't happen next time? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. All right. Wow. So this is in the March, uh, art March issue of, um, PHCP pros. If you want to read it and make your own notes, full point, um, doesn't work for everybody, but I can tell you, I've seen it work highly successful with a lot of other contractors. Um, yeah. Well, it's a lot of ideas, right? And, and you know, I think that you know, it's safe to say that some of these will work in whatever location you're in. Maybe not all of them, mm -hmm. but some of them, you know, you gave a lot of information here. And I will include the link to the article uh, in the description of this podcast as well. Oh. So to make it easier for our listeners to uh, to get to it. But that is some some excellent information, Ken. And I think that uh, my audience is going to just absolutely love it. I hope so. I hope, Hey, if they can get, if, if five people listen to this and they get five students out of the classroom working, I did my job. I'd like to see 500, but I'll take five. Hey, baby steps, man. That's what we got to do. Very cool. Well, listen, you know, that took us almost an hour, which is what I was Ooh. hoping was going to happen because it, I mean, there's just so much, <laughs> there's just so much, so much information in there, you know, but before we hop off, you know, I, I, I want to ask you first off, is there anything else that you were hoping to cover on this show? Uh, not today. I, I'd like to get back on here, you know, a month and a half or so and talk to you more about uh, my new venture with Interplay because I'm super excited about this. I just, uh, what a cool company to work for. Uh, Doug's just a great guy and the rest of the people that I've met so far, um, just been fantastic. High energy, really, really great pace. And just, you know, everybody wants everybody to succeed. And I don't, you know, that isn't always the, the case in the American workforce. That's absolutely. A lot of times it's cutthroat and it, this is not even close to that. Everybody wants everybody to do well. Absolutely. That's one of the biggest reasons we do business with Interplay. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, all right. Well, one more question for you, because I like to ask this to everybody and you know this. And I like to ask it to returning guests too, because it changes. So we talk a lot about success, you know, about how uh, different people define success different ways. So remind my audience, Ken, 
how do you define success? It's a cool question. I love it too. Um, me personally, um, I am doing an, a, a white collar job now and never had any college training for this. So my point is, is you never know where your career is going to take you. And this, so my success is where I'm at, right? But the point about that is you never know where your career is going to take you. Who would have thought that me as a 16 year old running through an eight foot trench with two five pound ladles of molten lead and the, the drunken journeyman throwing rocks at me saying I wasn't going fast enough that I would get to this point in my life, right? Who, who would have think <laughs> this would take you? So you never underestimate where a trade will start you at it. It's only the beginning, right? Yeah. It's only the beginning. You're, you're just starting to learn, you know? So I, I define success in accomplishing things that you never saw were going to happen, but you fall into those things. You know, everything happens for a reason. I'm a firm believer of that. Um, I, I, I'm a goal setter. So I think that's important to help get your dreams to come true is setting goals. Yeah. But success to me is doing something that you never thought you would be doing. If you, when I was 20 years old, if you said, Hey, you're going to be working from home behind a desk and working in a digital environment. I would have said, you're, you're crazy. <laughs> you're nuts. I'm not, I'm not going to work behind a desk ever in my entire life. I want to work out here in that fresh air and yeah. carry pipe and heavy bathtubs. That's what I want to do. You know, when I was 20, years old that's what you would hear from me that's, so you never know where your career is going to take you no that's really good advice ken and I, I i hope that my my audience can heed that you know especially the younger crowd because it is it's it's so important you don't know where you're going to be tomorrow uh, but as long as you take that first step and keep moving forward you're giving yourself an opportunity so very well said ken as always thank you so much for your information thank you so much for coming on the show man Love you, man. This was awesome. It was great. All right. Hey, uh, before we wrap it up, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at Interplay Learning. You can, best place to get me is at LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Um, I've got a lot of members and I'm pretty um, on it when somebody sends me, if somebody sends me a LinkedIn message or uh, sends me a uh, request to connect, I'm usually right on it. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Ken, for coming on the show. Yeah. I always appreciate it, my man. Thank you, too. Thanks for having me. It was a great time. It's always fun. All right. Take care, bud.